have another word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time to study together, to open up your word again. Thank you for the good meal. Help us to be alert and to and help us to be able to receive your word into our hearts and minds. So we ask for your, your help and the Holy Spirit and heavenly angels to be about us. Cast walk away Satan and his angels, and may we all come closer to thee and can understand more clearly the prophetic messages that you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And the King of the North, the glorious land and the King of the North. Remember last week we, we had this diagram and Daniel 2 had the head of gold, which was Babylon, oh, then, then the arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, the legs of iron, the feet of iron and clay, and the head of gold was Babylon, and arms of silver, Medo-Persia, Greece, the belly and thighs of brass, the legs of iron were pagan Rome, and then the clay mixing in with the iron, the iron, feet of iron and clay. That was a church-state system, the clay representing the church, mixing in with the state papal room. And then in Daniel 7, and these are parallel prophecies. And in Daniel 7, instead of metals, you have beasts. And the king of gold went with the king of beasts, the lion, and then the bear raised up on one side, the Persia, the leopard with four heads, Greece, the fourth the dreadful beast was pagan Rome. And what was papal Rome in this series? It was the little horn growing out from the fourth dreadful beast. And you can see there that the little horn is part of, is the second phase of the Roman Empire because it's part of the beast. It's growing out of the head of the fourth dreadful beast. And it's like in Daniel 2, the iron goes all the way down to the toes, but the feet have low clay. Is a phase. It's a second phase of the Roman Empire, and so the papacy today has the same goals as pagan Rome: conquer the world, control everyone's mind. Daniel eight and nine starts with Medo-Persia, the ram, with the higher horn last, two horns with the, the with the Persian horn, the strongest. And that's because pagan Babylon was toward the end of its uh, empire at that time when this vision was given. The he-goat with the notable horn was Greece, and the notable horn represented who? Alexander the Great. And he conquered the world in eight years, flying across the face of the earth. And then he died, and his empire was divided into four regions, to his four generals, and, and a goat. There is a goat that has four horns. And then the little horn comes out of the, one of those four wind areas, and it represents both pagan and papal Rome and Daniel 8 and 9. And then the next line of prophecy is Daniel. 10 through 12. 10 is the introduction. The main body is in 11, but it goes to 12 verse 4. And then an explanation is given after that. In all the, in all the prophecies, there's a giving of the prophecy and then an explanation in, this, in each of those four lines of prophecy. And, and it's important to know that they are all parallel. The same empires are, are followed to the end. Um, and the end in each of them is Christ's second coming. <coughs> there are some people today that are preaching that in Daniel 11, you always interpret it geographically. But in prophecy, when you come to New Testament period, things are interpreted spiritually and globally. 
and the battle is for the mine, not for geographic area. Um, and so some people are teaching that in Daniel 11, the king of the north is Turkey because it's geographically north of Israel. And uh, but, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that later. Verse 2 is about Medo-Persia. Verses 3 through 15 about Greece. 16 through 27 is about pagan Rome. Verses 29 through 39 is about papal Rome. Um, and one thing, if you want a copy of this, it'll be available from Brother Wilson. And uh, so you won't have to take a picture of it. Thank you. That last section is time of the end, 1798 to, the, to, uh, to our day, to Christ's second coming. And that's verses 40 to 45. The 40 to 45 in Daniel 11 is present truth verses, which starts in 1798. In Daniel 8 and 9, it's the cleansing of the sanctuary. And in Daniel 7, it's the judgment. And that's the time period we are in, in those prophecies. Now we're going to look in the, our study this afternoon, Daniel, about the verses Daniel 11, 40, and 41, which says, At the what, what time? Of the time of the end. Shall the king of the south. south push at him, which is the king of the north. And the king of the north will come against him like a whirlwind. And remember this, like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. And then verse 41 says, He shall enter also into the glorious land, and many shall be overthrown. There is a word in the Bible, uh, many countries, but it's in italics, and it should read, and many shall be overthrown. And so we're going to look at what time of the end means. The king of the south, who is he? Who is the king of the north? And what is the glorious land? in this study this afternoon. Daniel 11.40 says, And at the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him. When is the time of the end? 1790 is on How do you prove that biblically? <laughs> uh, from the going forth of the um, command to restore Bill Jerusalem uh, until... Uh, Messiah the Prince. Yes. Well, that, that's... What is when the Jews say? In Daniel 7... He's given a time when he shall rule uh, in one spot. Yes. This is Daniel 7, right here. We'll read it. Okay. He shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times, that's one and two years, and the dividing of times, half a year, Daniel 7, 25. So I'll just go on here. To, um, a time and time and the dividing of times is three and a half years. Three and a half years equals 42 months equals 1260 days, prophetic days. But in the Bible, a day of prophecy is a year. Ezekiel 4, verses 5 and 6. And thus, 1260 days represents 1260 years. And we remember that Daniel 7 said that he would wear out the saints for that period of time um, and speak great words against him and and think to change times and laws is included in that. Okay, so in Daniel eleven thirty three it says, And they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they sh shall fall by the sword, by the flame, by captivity, and by spoil. How many? Many days. Many days. And many days is the 1260 years that God's people would fall by the sword, by the flame, by captivity for many days. And so now, and so that's the period of time from 538 to 1798, 1260 years of papal persecution through the Dark Ages. And it was cut short a little bit by the Protestant Reformation which started to give the light back to the people. 
Verse 33 again, repeating it. They shall fall by the sword, by flame, by captivity. In many days, 1260 days. 34 says the same thing. Now when they shall what? Fall, they shall be holpen with a little help. And 35 again. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try to purge and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. And so they're falling many days, and that period of time will end at a time period called the time of the end. So that's what Brother Paul was talking about. It starts in 1798, 538 to 1798, was the 1260 days, but then after 1798 would be the period called the time of the end. That's the time we're living in right now. We're living in the end of the time of the end. And, we'll, and it will end at the close of probation. And so at the time of the end, with the king of the south pushing him, who is the king of the south? Well, geographically, where Israel is, south would be Egypt. In the Old Testament, it was Egypt. But now we're in 1798. And so Egypt is a little different. Who is the king of the south today? The Revelation 11 verse 8 says, And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. So Egypt now in the New Testament time is a spiritual entity, global and spiritual. Great controversy. Ellen White talks about it. Great controversy. 269 in the chapter on the French Revolution. She says spiritually Egypt. Of all the nations represented in Bible history, Egypt most boldly denied the existence of the living God and resisted his commands. So you look at Egypt and you look at what the character of Egypt was, and that would be spiritual Egypt. Egypt's character was denying the existence of the living God, resisting his commands. She says this is atheism. And the nation represented by Egypt would give voice to a similar denial of the claims of the living God. She says, this prophecy has received the most exact and striking fulfillment in the history of France. France was the first modern country to proclaim through its government that there is no God in the French Revolution. And that was a startling thing huh? that just uh, startled the world. The French Revolution was, a, was totally unlike the American Revolution, which happened just before the French Revolution. And there was a difference in the character of the revolutions because in America, people had the Bible. They could study it for themselves. They could be under, they could control themselves. But in France, they didn't have a Bible and they went out of control. You heard about the reign of terror. That was a horrible time. And, and French Revolution was the fruit of the papal teachings through the Dark Ages in France. The American Revolution was more controlled by Protestantism. And so in, in prophecy, in the Old Testament, things are local and geographical, and Egypt represents the area of south of Israel. But in the New Testament, things are global and spiritual, and Egypt today represents atheism. Does that make sense? Yeah. And atheism, we are still in the heyday of atheism right now because um, Daniel 11, in chapter 11 in Daniel is very much parallel to Revelation 17, the seven heads. And um, atheism is the sixth head in Revelation 17. And, and um, Atheism still hasn't been conquered totally in the world today. And it's a battle not over land, but over the mind. Atheism also goes by other terms, humanism, secularism, um, evolutionism. Um, and so these are other ways, other names for the king of the south. The king of the south will attack 1798, the time of the end. 
And this is what happened. And in that year, the French, the atheist French directory told Napoleon, we need to eliminate the papacy altogether. We want to eradicate it. And Napoleon sent his general Berthier. Remember, the French directory was atheist. Mm -hmm. And Berthier took the pope captive, yes. took him away to France, where he died in exile, took away his civil power, mm -hmm. and that was the deadly wound. And so the king of the south gave the king of the north, we'll, we'll, be, we'll see that the papacy is the king of the north, gave the king of the north the deadly wound. Push, the word push, he shall push at him, means to try to kill, you know, like a, like a bull trying to kill with the horns. And it was a deadly wound, and the people in Europe thought the papacy was dead at this time, that it would recover. France actually conquered geographical Egypt in the same year. So France did become geographically uh, Egypt as well as spiritually Egypt, which that's kind of an amazing thing too. France exalted the goddess of reason. That's human, the thought that human reasoning will solve every problem. Is that still prevalent in our world today? That's science. I mean, that's modern science, that idea is human reasoning, we're going to, we, yes, we'll have problems, but science will be able to stop, solve it. And so King of the South, its religion is atheism, its government is communism or socialism, and its science is evolutionism. Uh, Karl Marx continued after the French Revolution, Karl Marx wrote Communist Manifesto in 1848. His last sentence was, workers of the World unite, and when this book came out, there were revolutions all over Europe. And uh, Adventist pioneers, 1848. This was just when the Sabbath truth was beginning to be proclaimed. And they, and Ellen White had a vision where Jesus said, "Hold, hold, hold!" And then all of a sudden, those revolutions died down in Europe. No one knows why, but it was so that the ascending angel, with the Sabbath truth, the seal of God, could be proclaimed to the world. And this is an, this was an interesting uh, historical event where God's hand can be seen so that the Sabbath, three angels' messages could be proclaimed to the nation of kingdom time and people before the four winds were let loose. Uh, Charles Darwin combating the first angels' message with the origin of the species, 1859. And Survival of the fittest. 1917, the King of the South continues to push with the Russian Revolution. Here is Lenin and Stalin sitting together. And so then um, the King of the South becomes more organized um, politically. In 1925 was the famous Scopes Monkey Trial in Dayton, Tennessee. And here is um, Clarence Darrow defending evolutionism. And they lost uh, the trial, but they won the public relations. And, and after this, uh, by 1958, when the Sputnik went around, evolution was required in all the schools in the United States. Uh, in World War II, the King of the South pushes again, gaining many Catholic countries, pushing against the King of the North, in many Catholic countries in Eastern Europe soon after World War II. Remember, these were bumper, uh, buffer states for the USSR. And one of them was Croatia. And this was getting very close to Italy and to Rome. And so the Pope was getting a little nervous at this time. World War II and all, uh, in, the King of the South also influenced Hitler because of the theory of evolution, he started just attacking countries because of survival of the fittest applied to countries. We're going to be the master race. And, and they applied eugenics and the principles of Darwin. Yeah. 1949, uh, all of China went communist. And so the King of the North continued to push in, gaining a billion people. King of the South. What's that? King of the South, yeah. King of the South representing atheists. China going communist and atheist. Then the Cold War. Here's the battle between uh, 
atheism, Khrushchev, and, and Protestant America. The Korean War was a battle between communism and um, where it was pushing to try and gain more territory. It's still not over. The war has never ceased, really, it's just a pause. And then the King of the South enters our home through the television, movies, novels, cartoons, where you see uh, the good guy versus the ba bad guys. But no one's ever praying. They're just using their re reason, using force. God has never seen. And this is the sixth end. Educating, not just entertaining, but educating the American public. And then finally, the Vietnam War was the United States helping the Catholic Church, King of the North, in its fight against communism in Vietnam. There's a book called Vietnam, Why We Went, uh, Why we went There by Avro Manhattan. You can download it off the internet. And it shows that the purpose of the Vietnam War was to create a Catholic state in, in Vietnam, South Vietnam. But the King of the South would win in Vietnam. And Vietnam is communist still to this day. And so from 1798 to the 1980s, this is something we don't realize, the King of the South was pushing against Catholicism, the King of the North, in different areas, different times, um, in different ways. Evolutionism, we'll see. Um, by the 1980s, the King of the South controlled over a third of the world, different places. There was Cuba, close to the United States. But evolution conquered the whole world, even, even Adventist universities. Higher criticism, this was Darwin applied to study of the Bible, where you doubt miracles and explain them by uh, natural methods. And, and so this was higher criticism, controlled every seminary in the world that taught the ministers. And so the King of the South was pushing toward up to the 1980s. Then the King of the North would come against him, the King of the South, like a whirlwind, with chariots and horsemen, many ships. Who is the King of the North? Originally in the Bible, Jeremiah 25, verse 9, Behold, I will send and take all the families of the North saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, who was he? My servant. That's interesting. Nebuchadnezzar was God's servant. And will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants there. Ezekiel 26, verse 7. But thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will bring upon Tyrus, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the king of kings, from the north. And so... And look at this, with horses and with chariots and with horsemen and companies and much people. That sounds exactly like Daniel 11, 41, or, or the end of verse 40. Horses and chariots and horsemen. And so Babylon was the first and the original king of the north. Babylon was the first king of the north because it had to go up the Euphrates River, see where it's green, that's the Euphrates River. It couldn't go across the desert. It had to go up from the Euphrates River and then down the coast. So it came from the north through Israel down to Egypt. And so Babylon was the first. But then when Persia conquered Babylon, it became the king of the north, king of Babylon. Cyrus was the king of Babylon. Then Alexander conquered Babylon, and it became king of the north. And then his general, the Seleucids, became king of the north. And Daniel 11, he was, he was called king of the night. And then pagan Rome conquered the Seleucids. They became peg, uh, king of the north, geographically. And then papal Rome, uh, the second phase of the Roman Empire, is the king of the north today. You see the feet, the top of the head is Babylon, but the feet is also Babylon. And Babylon is there, the king of the north. But today, Babylon is not geographic. Babylon is spiritual and global. And the battle is for the mind. 
today in the New Testament, upon her forehead. It's a woman. Upon her forehead was a name written. Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Revelation 17, verse 5. So in the New Old Testament, things are geographical. First Babylon, then Medo-Persia, Alexander and Greece, and his general, the Seleucids, or also called the Antiochus generals, and then pagan Rome, and then in the New Testament, papal Rome, global and spiritual. Trying to control everyone's mind on planet Earth. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, well, atheism never uses uh, their agenda is to control the whole world if they can. But atheism just uses human reason. Catholicism uses Bible mixed with human reasoning, tradition. And so it's trying to do, do it that way. It's like a wolf clothed with sheep's clothing, too. And then the third force, there's a third force that's trying to control every mind on planet Earth. Can you think what that is? America. What's that? America. No. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel. Every yeah. To every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. God wants to control everyone's mind. And this is just with the Bible and the Bible only. So you go from human reasoning to the Bible and the Bible only and then in the mi a mixture in between, Catholicism. Um, so the King of the North and South today are Papal Rome and Atheism. And now the King of the North is going to battle back in 1989. The King of the North shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots and with horsemen, many ships. And he shall enter in the countries and overflow and pass over. Chariots and horsemen would represent military power, many ships, economic power. You know, the papacy doesn't have military power, but all through the Dark Ages it would say, King of France, the Pope would say, King of France, I want you to eradicate these heretics, and he would do it. And King of Spain, I want you to send an armada up to, up to England and eradicate Protestantism, and he would do it. And Duke of Savoy, those Waldenses need to be eradicated. And so his vassals would do the work. And today, who is the Pope's vassal? The United, States. United States. The papacy has no physical military force, but it uses its vassals, military power. And why is Reagan up there? Because in 1984, for the first time, fallen Protestant United States sends an ambassador to Vatican City for the very first time, under Ronald Reagan. And this was a violation of separation of church and state because uh, Vatican City, Vatican City is really, he was really, I shouldn't have said Vatican City because the ambassador was really sent to the Holy See, which controls the Vatican City because the church is always dominant over the state. And it's a violation of church and state that no one said anything. And do you remember this Time Magazine cover? The Holy Alliance? Yes. The United States supplies military and economic power, the chariots and horsemen and many ships, in this battle with the King of the South. And that's what it says right on the cover. Reagan and the Pope working together to hasten the demise of communism. That's the seventh and eighth head working to battle against the sixth head. So the King of the North with his vassal against the King of the South. The Holy Alliance. You can download that cover off the internet too. And so in 1989, 87, Reagan said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall, the Berlin Wall. And in 1989, it started, it was, it fell. And that began a opening up of many countries. First in Poland with uh, the Catholic Union Solidarity and the Pope working through La Valencia. But look at all those countries, I think, uh, in the 20s. Starting with Poland and East Germany and Romania, like dominoes, they were just like a whirlwind. They even used those words in the papers. 
like a whirlwind they fell from 1989, and if you look up in Soviet Union, 1991. Soviet Union fell in 1991 with Boris Yeltsin, the president. And so he shall end, he would push against the king of the south. And many communist countries fell. And people think that most of them fell, or all of them fell, but still we have five communist countries left. Who are they? Russia. Russia is not anymore. China is one. Vietnam. North Korea. North Korea Cuba. And uh, Laos is the fifth one. North Vietnam and South Vietnam are together called Vietnam. So there's five still going. Cuba's almost ready to fall. China's almost not communist too much anymore. But, um, but still they're there. But the king of the north, see when you go, you, when you come up the Euphrates River and then you come down to hit Egypt, you're going to have to go through another area. He said he shall enter also into the glorious land and many shall be overthrown. Countries is in the towers. Many are overthrown. What is the glorious land? Okay, here we see the glorious land geographically is in between Egypt and Babylon. In the Old Testament, that was the glorious land. Why? Because that's where Abraham's seed was. And Abraham's seed, if he be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed. Abraham's seed was always converted people. And that why, that's why it was the glorious land. God's character was seen there, but we'll see that. Uh, Israel, meaning overcomer, in the Old Testament, local and geographic, in the New Testament, global and spiritual. So in the, in the battle is for the mind. Ellen White says in Great Controversy 594, none but those who have fortified the mind with the truths of the Bible will stand through the last great conflict. So the battle is for the mind. The battle of Armageddon is for the mind. The king of the, the Satan's forces may use force, but God's people will not. We will use prayer, shield of faith, Sword of the Spirit, those are our weapons. We don't use force. Exodus 33, 18. Okay. The glorious land. Is this term describing a divine glory or is it describing an earthly glory? You can I think you can tell it's God is calling it a glorious land because it's it's there's a divine glory about it. It's not an it's not an earthly glory. If, if, if it were on earth, the glory, it couldn't be Israel. Israel, Israel was the most glorious place on earth. It would yeah. have to be Babylon, then Medo, Persia, uh, Greece, and Rome. Yeah. Those were the four oh, Okay, that's a good point, because where did Babylon get its crown from? Remember Ezekiel, I think, uh, 21, where God says, take off the crown from Zedekiah, and, and Babylon took it, and then he would be overturn, 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 until Jesus comes, is right it is. Um, and so, yeah, the, so the, Israel was a glorious land with, with the great temple that Solomon built with one of the seven wonders of the world. And um, Israel was in perfect order when it was godly, and it was a glorious land. And further, in Exodus chapter 8:25. He said to Moses, let them build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Yeah. And his presence, God's presence. Exactly right. Yep. Yeah. God's presence was there. And today, Jesus says, if two or three are gathered together in my name, there will I be in your midst. That's all over the place. That's global. Um, but we'll see here now. Moses asked God, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And God said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. That was God's character. God's glory is his character. So the glorious land is the place where God's character is in his people. Think of this... Uh, I won't say... Yeah. Okay. There's another battle going on, and that's people think 
There's two, two um, opinions. One is that the glorious land is God with his people. God, the real glorious land is heaven. But God has outposts of heaven on this earth where his people are all over the earth. The other thought is that the glorious land is the United States. And how glorious would the United States really be if everyone was converted? Because then it would be really glorious because the glorious land is in the United States, which is God's converted people. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. One thing about the glorious land, spiritual, is that you cannot see it. It's not outward glory. It's inward glory. When Jesus died on the cross, he died in darkness. But his glory was seen. And so great was his glory that angels no longer let Satan in heaven anymore. They saw his character. He revealed his character too. Psalm 3, verse 3, But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory, and the lifter of my head. So God is our glory. Psalm 72, 19, Blessed be his glorious name forever. And let the whole earth be, what? Filled with his glory. Amen and amen. Um, does that remind you of any other verse? That's from Psalm 72, 19. Let the whole earth be filled with his glory. That's a lot like 18 verse 1. And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And that glory, that great power, is the power of the gospel to change people from the inside so that God's glory can be seen outside. But I believe this glory will be seen when God's people are on the witness stand in court. And it's not that the whole world's going to be converted. They will just, it will, God's glory will lighten the whole earth. Everyone will see it and have to make a decision. But the majority will wonder after the least. They can't even know. Um, and so God's professed people are standing on the firm platform of the three angels' messages. And that's the glorious land. That's the true church. The true Seventh-day Adventist church. Fear God and give glory to him. Remember Ellen White said, I saw a firm platform with three steps. The first, second, and third angels' messages. And those that were standing on top were standing with Jesus. And God looked upon them. She saw a little company standing there with God's approval. Giving no countenance to those that would... would uh, giving no countenance to those that would... Uh, just... I think we'll read it in this picture. Giving no countenance to those who would um, eradicate the established faith of the body, something like that, which is the general conference. In the Bible, Mount Zion is glorious. Psalm 15, 1 and 2 says, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle, the God's temple? Who, will, who shall dwell in my holy hill? That holy hill is Mount Zion. The answer is, he that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. So they are part, they will dwell in Mount Zion. Isaiah 51, 16, Sam to Zion, thou art my people. Isaiah 59, 20 says, and the Redeemer shall come to Zion and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. So God's people are part of heavenly Zion. Psalm 20, 125, verse 1, very clear. They that trust in the Lord shall be as what? Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abideth forever. And so if we are with Christ, standing on the three angels' messages, we are not only the true Seventh-day Adventist church, but we are Mount Zion, and we are part of the glorious land, wherever we may be. Isaiah 4, verse 2, In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious. And that word glorious is the same word in Daniel 11. And the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. Escaped from the king of the north. Yeah. 
The next verse says, in verse 3, Isaiah 4, verse 3, And it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion, and he that remaineth in Jerusalem, shall be called holy. Even everyone that is written among the living in Jerusalem. Is that old Jerusalem? No, it's new Jerusalem. And written in the Lamb's Book of Life in the new Jerusalem. And so God's church is, God counts us as sitting in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2, verse 5 and 7. Isaiah 4, verse 5. And, and the Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion and upon her assemblies a cloud and a smoke by day and the shining of a flaming fire by night. For upon all the glory shall be a defense. And what is the cloud of smoke by day and the shining of a flaming fire by night? Today, Ellen White says, this is the pillar of cloud that leads us where? To the promised land. And this is, uh, and God's glory is in this book, his character. First Peter 2, verse 9, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. See, we're, see, we're not the United States. We're not from any nation. We represent heaven, a holy nation, a peculiar people. That ye should show forth the praises of him who had called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, or you could say his glorious light. And yes, God's people are not to join any national government because we are ambassadors for heaven. We may be born in Jamaica, or the United States, or Kenya, or Russia, but when we're converted, we're born again, and we're born from above, Amen. representing you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Ephesians 5, verse 8, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now ye are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Amen. Walk as children of light. The church of God below is one with the church of God above. That's pretty amazing too, isn't it? And that shows, that's an Ellen White quotation. That shows that the church above and the church below, those who are really converted, are one. And even right now, when we meet here to worship, the center of Christian worship is the heavenly sanctuary. This is just the meeting place in the, in the courtyard of the heavenly sanctuary. Believers on earth and the beings in heaven who have never fallen constitute one church. 16366. And so God's professed people, not just by themselves, but with the church above, are standing on the three angels' messages, and they're the glorious Lamb. That's the glorious Lamb. What is the glorious Lamb? It's God's, where God's presence is, where God's church is. For in, in Isaiah 57, 15, it says, God says, I am, for thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit. That's right. So God has God has us as his outposts in on this earth. This was the glorious land picture of it in the Old Testament, God's people around his sanctuary. Like Brother Paul said, God wanted to dwell with his people. And God's people surrounding the sanctuary in perfect order and and God's character seen there. In Numbers 24, 5 and 6, Balaam looked upon this scene and he said, How goodly are thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacles, O Israel, as the waters, or as the valleys, are they spread forth as gardens. And I can't see the rest of it. As gardens by the riverside, yes. The prosperity of God, and Ellen White comments on this verse, she says, The prosperity of God's people is here, Present, represented by some of the most beautiful figures to be found in nature. The people, uh, the prophet likens Israel to fertile valleys covered with abundant harvest, to flourishing gardens watered by never failing springs. So this is the glorious land, isn't it, spiritually, um, uh, likened to the glorious land. Today, the glorious land is spiritual and global. This is you see a praying family down there on, uh, in Tennessee, it looks like. Right? <laughs> um, maybe it's near the Great Lakes. But, but wherever it is on planet Earth, 
you can see the connection to the heavenly sanctuary. And that's God's people. We're all over the earth uh, encamped around the heavenly sanctuary today. That's the glorious life. Spiritual and global. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So God's church will be the glorious land when he comes again. Uh, and so in the Old Testament, it represented the land of Canaan. In the New Testament, it's the territory of truth. In the Old Testament, it was Israel. In the New Testament, it's the church, the glorious land. Ellen White uh, has this. This is a very important statement from Paulson Collection, 137, 138. I am told that before finishing the life of Christ, I ought to visit Jerusalem, the Holy Land. What made it holy? The majesty of heaven clothed his divinity with humanity and dwelt upon our earth. He was despised and rejected of men. In Jerusalem, he was crucified by wicked hands. I have not the slightest inclination to visit Jerusalem. And I hope everyone here doesn't have a anchoring to go there. To see where it is thought probable that Jesus tried. Where he may have labored. Where he may have been crucified. They're all tourist traps. I can trace his footsteps in the sure word of prophecy and can obtain a better idea of his works and of his ways than I could by visiting Jerusalem defiled with unholy feet and unholy deeds. I wish to see Jerusalem when the fires of the, of the last great day shall have cleansed it from all sinful defilement. Now notice this. Jerusalem is now no more sacred to me than any other place on the globe. That means, that includes the United States. There's no no holy place on the globe, geographically. And I'm, I'm going to pause there. I'm going to just say, okay, what if it was the United States? When did, the, when did the King of the North enter into the United States? Well, it was in 1634 when the colony of Maryland, Maryland, was established. 1634. That was way before 1798. And so the United States couldn't be the land where the United States, the glorious land where the United States enters into, because it's always there. It's always been there. It was the seventh colony to be brought into the United States. That's right in the middle of one and thirteen. And if it was the United States, the, the uh, King of the North entering the United States, that means the rest of Adventism all around the world should be in pretty good shape. But we know it's not. And so the United States cannot be the glorious land. In fact, when the devil took Jesus up to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all the glory of them, I'm pretty sure he showed Jesus the United States at the end of this world. Because it looks pretty good outwardly. But, okay, now, this is finishing up that Paulson statement. Listen to this. Wherever, Ellen White says, wherever by his Holy Spirit Jesus makes known his presence, there I am pleased to be. Wherever his righteousness shines forth in bright and glorious beams, there I am pleased to be. Wherever his divine love illuminates the humble places of the earth, there I am pleased to be. Wherever his honor dwells, there I am pleased to be. Paulson Collection, 137, 138. There, that's a wonderful description of the glorious land. 1 John 1, verse 7. Walk in the light as he is in the light. And if you don't walk in the light, where are you at? Darkness. How can you be the glorious land if you're not following Jesus? Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Gather together in my name. His name is Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. First Peter 4.14, 4, if, if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. You are the glorious man. Second Corinthians 3.18, for we all with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image, from glory to glory as by the spirit of the Lord. 
Once glorious, always glorious? Uh, sometimes you think, how can the glorious, how can the Canaan or enter into the glorious land? That's impossible. But if you believe that, then you would say, once saved, always saved. Because once glorious, always glorious? No. And Isaiah shows this in Isaiah 28. He says, Woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty, that's the same Hebrew word, word is glorious lamb, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower which are on the head of the fat bellies of them that are overcome with wine. What kind of wine? Babylonian wine. And this is a description of what's happening today in Adventism. A fading flower, the glory is changed into a fading flower. Verse 2. Behold, the Lord hath a mighty and strong one, king of the north, which as a tempest of hail and as destroying storm, as a flood of mighty waters overflowing, shall cast down to the earth with the hand Many shall be overthrown, but not all. The crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim, he, Israel, shall be trodden under feet, and the glorious beauty which is on the head of the fat valley shall be a fading flower. That's that same glorious word for glorious life. In that day shall the Lord of hosts be for a crown of glory, and for a diadem of beauty unto the residue of his people. And for a spirit of judgment to him that sitteth in judgment, and for strength to them that turn the battle to the king. But they also have erred through wine and strong, and through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. So it's because of Babylonian wine. And what came into the Adventist church in 1955-56? Three Babylonian doctrines that took away the heart of Adventism and changed the church completely. Yea, they despise the pleasant man. That pleasant word pleasant is the same as glorious. The glorious. They despise the glorious land. They believe not his word. Psalm 106, 24. They say if a man put away his wife and she go from him and become another man, shall he return unto her again? Shall not that what? land be greatly polluted and so the wife represents a church and if it and it apostatizes it's a land that is greatly polluted so here the church is called a land but thou hast played the harlot with many lovers yet return again to me says the Lord God is very merciful to us lift up thine eyes into the high places and see where thou hast not been lying with and the ways hast thou been sat for them as the Arabian in the wilderness, and thou hast polluted the land with thy whoredoms and with thy wickedness. Therefore the showers have been withheld, and this is why we have no matter in today, because thou hast a whore's forehead, and refusest to be ashamed. The Lord, having saved his people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not, to five or six. See, God saved his people out of Egypt, but once saved, always saved? No, they did not believe. And the angels which kept not their first estate left their own habitation. They were in the real holy, glorious land of heaven. And so the, if you, the glorious land is not always. It requires uh, uh, renewed faith and decisions among us every day. There is to be a shaking. We talked to, someone talked about the shaking today. Do you know that shaking is not, I want to emphasize, the shaking is not in or out of a church system. The shaking is in or out of truth. truth. Yeah, right. And 2 Thessalonians 13, Donald um, says, there is to be a shaking among God's people. Yeah. It will be the result of refusing the truth presented. You can stay in the church and be shaken up. Yes, and, and really, everyone is who stays in right now, because in 1955 56, the church was shaken up of the truth. And, but they kept the name, they kept the structure, and many people are deceived today. The mighty shaking has commenced and will go on, and all will be shaken up who are not willing to take a bold and unyielding stand, unyielding stand for the truth and to sacrifice for God and his cause. Early writings, page 50. 
And this was written before there was even a general conference. As the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. We used to think, read this and think, that means they're going to leave the church. But no, it means they're, they're going to abandon their position of truth and join the ranks of the opposition in error. And so that's what's happened today. The 28 statements teach ecumenicalism, and the three angels' messages are going the opposite direction to heaven. Living in the glorious land. This is a uh, statement from education. With the word of God in his hands, every human being, wherever his lot in life may be cast, wherever in lot his life may be cast, he may be in Russia, Germany, Netherlands, South Africa, Ghana, Kenya, Cuba, wherever you are, China, wherever you are, may have such companionship as he shall choose. As he studies and meditates upon the themes into which the angels desire to look, he may have their companionship anywhere on earth. He may dwell in this world in the atmosphere of heaven, imparting to earth sorrowing and tempted ones thoughts of hope and longings for holiness, himself coming closer, still closer into the fellowship with the unseen. See, here's this, this, these thoughts are from Ellen White education. How, what is life like in the glorious land? She's describing it. Like him of old who walked with God, drawing nearer and nearer to the threshold, that's the doorway of the eternal world, until the portals shall open and he shall enter there, he will find himself no stranger. He will find himself no stranger. The voices that will greet him are the voices of the holy ones who unseen were on earth his companions. Voices that here he learned to distinguish and to love. He through the word of God, he who through the word of God has lived in fellowship with heaven will find himself at home in heaven companionship. That's a wonderful that's a, another wonderful description of living in the glorious land here on this earth. It says that many shall be overthrown. You know, I, I somehow um, uh, I somehow skipped over a key verse in Psalms where it says um, that the king's daughter is all glory is all glorious within Psalm forty five. Her garments are made of wrought gold, and the glory. The king's daughter is all glorious within. And, um, and so that's an unseen glory. I just want to emphasize that. The glorious land is not seen. And we may be washing dishes or, or you know, fixing a car at work or building a house or things that just look normal, but inside our heart, the beams of heaven's light are shining. And, God can see the glorious land. It's kind of like the seal of God and the mark of the beast. They're not invisible, but um, the angels can see it. And so many shall be overthrown. And last week we looked at um, three entrance of the king of the north and the new glorious land in Daniel 11. And uh, I, 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 want to, I want to continue this study if you don't mind. Um, and I thank you for your patience. Okay. In Daniel 11, the King of the North comes three times, and they correlate with Christ's three phases of ministry in the courtyard, mm -hmm. the holy place, and the most holy place. Mm -hmm. The first attack of the King of the North, or entrance into the glorious land, is in verse 16. When he, the King of the North, cometh against him, the King of the South, the Ptolemies, or, uh, yeah, and shall do according to his will, and none shall stand before him. He shall stand in the glorious land. And that was Pompey, the Roman general Pompey, conquering the glorious land of Palestine in 63 BC, which by his hand shall be consumed. That was uh, pagan Rome. And, he, and so now they controlled the courtyard, Palestine, the geographic area. That was the courtyard. And pagan Rome controlled uh, Galilee, Judah, where, when Christ was there. Verse 20, 
1 and 22 talks about Christ's crucifixion. He shall come in peaceably, this is talking about Tiberius Caesar, and obtain the kingdom of, by flatteries, and with the arms of a flood shall be, they shall be overflown from before him, and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. And when Christ was there on the cross, he looked like a criminal and a heretic. But in God's eyes, that's the glorious life. Second attack, in verse 29. At that time appointed, the king of the north would return and come toward the south. Remember when you go toward the south, Egypt, you go through the glorious land. But it shall not be as the former, that's the courtyard phase, or as the latter, the most holy, the third entrance, the most holy phase, most holy place phase. In this verse, you can see there's three entrances, the one in 29, and the one that's former, and the one that's latter. There's three of them. And this time is the attack on the holy place. Verse 31 says, Arm shall stand on his part. That's when Clovis, or Constantine, and Clovis gave their military power to the bishop of Rome. Arm shall stand on their part. And they shall pollute the sanctuary strength. That's the heavenly sanctuary. Psalm 96, verse 6. And they shall take away the daily. That's Christ's continual ministry in the holy place. And they shall place the abomination that make it desolate. And so um, it was an attack against the heavenly sanctuary and Christ's ministry there in the holy place. Daniel 8 and 9 talks about it also. The little horn which waxed exceeding great toward the south, toward the east, and toward where? The pleasant land. That word pleasant is the same as glorious, the same Hebrew word. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. That's Jesus. The Pope would magnify himself. See, magnify himself even to the prince of the host. That's a vertical attack because now Christ is not on earth anymore. He's in heaven. So Satan has to up update his attack. And it's a vertical attack into the religious world, going from pagan Rome to papal Rome. The daily sacrifice was taken away. The daily was taken away, the Talmud. And the place of the sanctuary was cast down. And if you compare these verses, notice that in the red on the left, by him was the daily taken away. The same as in Daniel 11, 31, he shall take away the daily, or the Talmud. And that's things in the holy place, like the table of showbread was on the table continually, Tamid. The altar of incense was burning, Tamid, daily. The candlestick was burning, Tamid, continually. And then, in the gold, you see the same thing. The place of the sanctuary cast down on the left, they shall pollute the sanctuary's strength on the right. And while they are doing that on the right, look at the last part, they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. Right across from that, the place of the sanctuary cast down, and in its place, they're placing the abomination that maketh desolate. So the papacy uh, replaced Christ's ministry with a human ministry. You had to confess your sins to a priest. Not Christ's sacrifice, but the sacrifice of the Mass. Um, no one had a Bible, but unless you could read Latin. And, and then if you... And then the candlestick was replaced, or was taken away too, because people that had the light were burned at the stake. And so the second entrance was in the holy place, and various things that were tami were taken away by the king of the north, the papacy, even oh, even the continual ministry. And the mitre was worn continually tami, and the breastplate was worn continually tami. That was taken away. No one even knew what Christ was doing for all the dark ages, even up till uh, even up till 1844, was the sanctuary. The knowledge of the sanctuary wasn't restored. So the entrance of now the third attack into the most holy place. He shall enter also into the glorious land, and many shall be overthrown. This is an attack in the third phase of Christ's ministry today, and we looked at it this morning, um, and it would occur by 1991. And that's because Babylon, when it hits Egypt, 
see how Babylon goes down to Egypt. By the time Babylon hits Egypt, it will have already gone to the glorious land. And so when Papal Rome hits atheism in 1991, Soviet Union fell and all those countries, it would have gone through the glorious land. And that would be the Three Angels Message movement here on this earth. It, how did it do it? Well, in Jude 3 it says, we should earnestly contend for the faith once delivered to the saints, for certain men have crept in how? They, they creep. Creep means slow, a slow creeping, and stealthy, unaware, secret. Slow and secret. So, and this may have happened to you. You see something startling. That's, that's wrong. And then, no one says anything. You, you're waiting for someone to voice uh, protest, and no one says anything. So then you say, well, it must, must not be as bad as I think. Mm -hmm. And then time passes, years pass, and you forget about it. And then something else happens, and the same thing. And the God wants dogs that bark. And here are some, uh, these are ringleaders of apostasy. And those arrows, remember Phineas threw javelins? Well, we can't throw javelins, but we can throw arrows of calling for repentance. Okay. But we know that that won't happen because uh, nothing will be allowed to stand in the way of any movement. Um, Joel talks about four generations of his army that eats away at God's land. Um, the palmer comes in and eats, and that which the palmer worm has left, the locust eats. So the second generation, the locust comes in, then the third generation, the canker worm comes in and eats what the locust leaves behind. And then the fourth generation, the canker worm, eats what the caterpillar leaves behind. And how many generations of Adventism are there? Maybe since Ellen White has died. People, at least four generations of Adventism, slowly eating away the the uh, at the glorious land and making it a uh, fading flower. The entrance of the kingdom on earth is stealthy and gradual. I think one thing that I see where it starts is when in 1901, Ellen White called for a reform in the church government where there was no one person at the top. And they did follow it, but in 1903 they reversed that and it's remained there ever since. And so in 1903, they chose a hierarchical papal church government structure. It's called the Seventh-day Adventist Church, so no one thinks it's papal, but it's the same. You just replace president with pope and cardinals with division leaders and, and bishops with union leaders, you know, and go on down. And so today, we have a hierarchical church structure like that. Uh, this is a general conference, divisions, unions, conferences, uh, ministry, uh, what was that? Divisions, uh, union, conference, pastors, yeah, and members. In 1922, worldly accreditation was accepted and a Catholic approved medical system was received. And this you can see happen, in, especially in 1996 when Porter SDA Hospital merges with the Catholic Hospital in Denver, Colorado. And this has happened three times now. It just happened recently in Walla Walla, where the Walla Walla Adventist Hospital yes. was bought by the Ch uh, Sisters of Mercy, yes. and, and they're working together now. In 1929, worldly accreditation was received in the educational field, and the Catholic-approved edu educational system was received. This is the seminary at Andrews University. And I graduated from Andrews University, by the way. My brother graduated from Andrews University from the seminary, too. And, but, Samuel Bakayoki, what university did he go to? The, the Gregorian Pontifical University in Rome. All of his credits were accepted, and he went straight to the Andrews University Seminary to teach the ministers. And so we have the same educational system. After the 1955-56 Martin and Barnhouse meetings, 
the Adventist Church said, we are a mainstream church now. Therefore, we're going to make our colleges, we just had, we, we didn't have universities. Yet. We're going to make them universities. Universal. We're going to be like all the other church denominations. Yes. And so Andrew University, in 1960, became the first university. It used to be called Emmanuel Missionary College, Southern Missionary College, Washington Missionary College. But now they're not Missionary College anymore. And so we studied this. The Martin and Barnhouse meetings, 1955 and 56, where three vital doctrines were accepted and repudiated in order to be accepted by the fallen Babylonian churches. The Trinity was the first one. And Christ coming in uh, sinless flesh was the second one. And that his work in the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary was not vital for our salvation. It was all done at the cross. So you, that was God being repudiated, Christ, the real Christ, repudiated, and where he is being repudiated. That's Christ is the light of the world. Now the heavens church is in darkness, walking in an ecumenical light. And so the Joan Conference was welcomed by Protestants as a sister church into the courtyard. And by the way, by the way, you, you probably sometimes it just kind of goes right by us, but this is the fulfillment of Daniel 11.41, the attack on the most holy place. That was it. And, and we hardly even know about it. See, things spiritual can happen so subtly that, you, that, it, it's, that it's not seen. So everything else looks the same. And you almost, you almost think, well, is that real? Did it really happen? Well, yes, it did really happen. This was the attack in the most holy place by the king of the north coming into the glorious land. Becoming part of that one. Right? Sister Church in the courtyard. Yeah. 1962, Vatican uh, through 64, it was the Vatican II Ecumenical Council. Now that the SDA Church shook hands with fallen Protestantism, that's when there was no more opposition to Rome. Vatican II Council was the first time that the Roman Catholic Church embraced the ecumenical movement. The major aim was the merging of all Christendom, and finally, the blending of all religions across the, across the planet. Not just Christian ecumenicalism, all religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, Judaism, all coming together. That's the goal. The vehicle, using celebration activity, celebration termino terminology, the power of music to facilitate the change. They invited the religious press to observe the proceedings. And Arthur Maxwell was one of the observers. He wrote the Bible stories. Yeah. Upon his return, he called for the scrapping of the old evangel evangelistic sermons of, on the papacy and a completely new approach. I sat closer to the Pope than any of the cardinals. I was only 40 feet away from him for three or four hours. Nobody knew will ever believe me that I sat so long, so near to his holiness. He told about his new friendliness. The Pope's opening speech was on love. And there was probably a spirit there that, you know, an enchanted ground that just took, totally um, brainwashed him. Also, Observing was B.B. Beach, who became friends with the Catholic and World Council of Churches leader, leaders at that time. He set up the first meetings between the World Council of Churches and the SDAs, which took place in 1969 and 73. And he would become the SDA representative to all the World Council of Church meetings and many other ecumenical organizations. And. Uh, like the Roman Catholic Church, the SDA Church became a member of the key faith and order commission of the World Council of Churches so that it can say that it's not a member of the World Council of Churches directly. And by the way, they wrote a book together, B.B. Beach and the World Council of Churches, and the title of it was So Much in Common. 
Sometime in the 1960s, the Adventist Book and Bible Houses later were renamed Adventist Book Centers, and they became purveyors of Babylonian wine, selling books by popular apostate Christian authors, Protestant authors. So they're selling, it's a Babylonian wine bookstore as well. In 1972, the Autumn Council was held in November 1975, or mean, uh, 1972, and in Mexico City, notice outside the United States, where it adopted a new policy on church-state relationships that established guidelines under which church-operated educational institutions could accept government aid. And by 1975, 50% of all the aid from universities, Adams universities, was from the government. And that's the Union of Church and State. Here's that book, 1973, B.B. Beach and World Council of Churches, writing so much in common. In 1976, Neil Wilson, notice he, this is a sworn tape statement under oath in U.S. court, said, although it is true that the SDA took church took a distinctly anti-Roman Catholic viewpoint, that attitude on the church's part was, was nothing more than a manifestation of widespread anti-popery among conservative Protestant denominations, and which has now been assigned to the historical trash heap so far as the SDA church is concerned. That was a sworn statement under oath. And that means the great controversy was thrown into the trash heap. And, and that statement and that, that book, Betrayal, is a, a very interesting, and once you start reading it, you can't put it down if you finish it, by um, Macleod, mm -hmm. Marike and Macleod. Yeah. In 1977, B.B. Beach gives a gold medal to the Pope. He has a private audience with Pope Paul VI in Vatican, presents him a gold medallion confirming what? Friendship of the SDA Church with the Vatican. And those words were right from the Review and Herald, August 11, 1977. And this is what the medal looked like. He put it right into the hands of the Pope. And the Pope probably had a collection of all the churches now that was friends with him. And notice that um, the Fourth Commandment, the words of the Fourth Commandment, are exactly how it's found in the Catholic Catechism. Just remember the Sabbath day. And notice the Maltese cross there below the Bible. Notice that Christ is standing on a mountain. You know that his feet don't, don't touch the earth. And the angels aren't collecting God's people. They're faced the other way. So it's a very strange um, medallion that was given to the Pope. In 1980, a Catholic god, a false god, entered the Adventist church, the Trinity. Belief in Trinity is the only requirement for membership in the World Council of Churches. Here's the uh, statements 12, 13, and 14. Notice the definition of the church is defined as the community of believers that confess Jesus Christ. That is every, that is every Christian believer from every denomination. Point number 13 is the remnant church, which is defined as part of the universal church. Point number 14 is unity in the body of Christ, which is the church defined in point number 12, which is all the churches, and is based on belief in the Trinity. This is ecumenicalism, written right here in the 28, 28 statements, and uh, it's identical to the words of the Pope and to the World Cup Council of Churches. Ellen White's prediction was fulfilled, a new organization would be established. Here is a definition. Here's the definition of the church again. The church is the community of believers who confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Can you see how that's every church system? The community of believers. That's the Adventist church, but it's also the Presbyterian church, the Lutheran church, the Catholic church, and the... Uh, that's the Oh, that's the Methodist Church, and that's the Lutheran Church. And then the Assemblies of God, and the Nazarene Church, and the Orthodox Church, and the Coptic Church, and the Baptist Church, and the Worldwide Church of God Prophecy, and 
the Dallas Theological Seminary must be very close to because it looks like they're preaching the three angels' messages, doesn't it? And so they're all part of this definition. And that's really true. They're all part of that. By the way, if you look at the... The Adventist Church has dialogues with other church systems, and they will say that we're all one family. And they will... And at the top, this is their understanding. We're all part of the same community, the church community. And... But Ellen White says the definition of the church should read like this. God has a church. It's not the great cathedral. It's not the national establishment. It's not the various denominations. It is the people who love God and keep his commands. It's not a community. It's not fake communities. It's people. Because God has people in all the Babylonian churches. God has people. But they but you can't say the commun you can't say the church system is is God. It's people who love God and keep His command. And we can't judge who they are either. In 1980, those statements, there was no definition of the second angel's message, no identification of Babylon, her fall or God's call to come out of it. No definition of the third angel's messages in the 20th, 27 or 28 statements. No identification of the beast is in the Jeremiah. But the three angels' messages is the really the foundation of the true Seventh-day Adventist Church. But now they're making the 28 statements, the false foundation. 1981, the General Conference trademarks the name Seventh-day Adventist under commercial law. And so now many little Seventh-day Adventist churches, not sponsored by the General Conference, are threatened with a commercial lawsuit we're using the spiritual name that identifies them as standing on the firm platform of truth, the three angels' messages. So we can't use that name. In 1982, Adventist Church signs the BEM document, which stands for Baptism, Eucharist, and Ministry. And what this is about is that Baptism, Eucharist, or the Lord's Supper, and Ministry are all acceptable among all the churches. That's why in the Adventist Church, we have open communion now. And everyone's welcome, even if you're not even baptized. And, and in the book, 27 Statements, it says another word for the Lord's Supper is Eucharist. Unbelievable. And Ministry Magazine um, goes to more non-Adventist pastors than Adventist pastors. Uh, Raul Dederen, I think, I'm suspect him, signs for all the SDA members. That means you signed as well if you're a member of the Adventist Church. And the World Council of Churches says this was a vital step in the ecumenical process. 1982, it was signed. No one, no one even heard about it. And, uh, oh, and by the way, beliefs number 15, 16, and 17 are baptism, Lord's Supper, and ministry. Interesting. Right after unity of the church, Number 14. That that's, seems more than just coincidental to me. In 1983, after 26 years, Walter Martin writes to the General Conference. See, he was getting a lot of letters from the Adventists saying, no, we don't believe what you agreed to in 1955 and 6. We don't agree with that. So he writes to the General Conference. Do you still hold to what we officially agreed upon in questions on doctrines in 1957? And Richard Lesher, Vice President, Officially respond. The answer is yes. 1984. Did you know this? 1,500 Hungarians were disfellowshipped by the General Conference President Neil Wilson. In, in, why? Because in 1984, this was before atheism, King of the South, fell, the Hungarian Church was directly part of the World Council of Churches. And when their, when their Sabbath school quarterly, was the same one used in the Baptist Church or the Methodist Church or all the churches used the same quarterly. If you wanted to be a minister, you had to go to the same seminary as the Baptist. And so this, the teachers were teaching Adventists and Baptists and, and they said, no, this is, this is confusion. This is not even on the three angels' messages. We cannot do it anymore. So 1,500 separated themselves. And they, they were meeting out in Budapest. So the union leader, his, 
he tried to solve the situation by transferring the leaders to to country churches way out from the capital so they wouldn't have much influence. We're going to transfer you over there and we're going to transfer this leader over there. But they refused. They refused to be moved. They stayed and, they, and their movement grew. And so then uh, they disfellished him. They were disfellowshipped. Well, let's see. They were, there was a big battle. So they appealed to the division president. He came over, talked with them, agreed with them, talked to the union communists. He was really a communist. And they changed their mind, came back and said, no, you're going to have to come with the, with the uh, back to the church, back to the union. And then they appealed to Neil Wilson, because they thought, well, he's, way, he's in the West. He's going to understand Adventism. And he'll, he won't have that pressure of communism on him. So he came and talked with them. He agreed with them. Talk, went to the Union man, changed his mind again, and he said, I'm sorry, but either you, we will support the church that's supported by the state. That became the Neil Wilson doctrine. We support the church that's supported by the state. Not we support the church that has the truth. We support the church that's supported by the state. And that's what's happening now in China. There's the Free Self Movement Church that's official and has the atheists at the top controlling it. And then there's the underground church. Well, the 1500 were now underground. And he said, you have to join, you have to come back to the union or I have to disfellowship you. And, and they said, no, that's not, that's not on the Three Angels' Messages. So they stayed uh, on the Three Angels' Messages while the other church was shaken out, but still, still the Seventh-day Church, and Neil Wilson kicked him out. And it's kind of like that blind man that Jesus healed. He was cast out, but then Jesus found him, and he said, your part of the fold. Yeah. And so 1984, that was happening for their protest of the ecumenical involvement of the SDA Church in Hungary. On the right road, nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. 1985, a new ecumenical hymnal where the Catholic Bible, the New Jerusalem Bible, was used two and a half times more than the Protestant King James Version. And so this hymnal had also different hymns in it. Hymn number 403, where sun worship was taught. When I fall on my knees with my face to the rising sun, O Lord, have mercy on me. Hymn number 471, virtually identical to the hymn sung to the Pope at Vatican Square, Father, grant us your peace. Four identical verses in English, French, Spanish, and what's the fourth language? Latin. And what Adventist is in what country that speaks Latin? Because Latin is the official language of only one country. What language is that? What country is that? Vatican City. And, and it's also very repetitious. 18 new hymns to the Trinity that were never found in any other church hymn. Hymn number 402, as they sings about transubstantiation, transubstantiation, that's where the, the bread, the, the wafer, was, is changed into the actual flesh and blood of Jesus and the Eucharist. His broken body in our stead is here in this memorial bread. And so these songs are just tokens, but for Babylon, it's good enough. Yes, it's we can approve of this hymnal. And so 1985, a Catholic-approved hymnal came into the Adventist Church. In 1990, mm -hmm. B.B. Beach, Zimri, Numbers chapter 25, and the Baal Pure Apostasy, and the Fifth Business Meeting, this, this was all quoted right in the Review and Herald of the report of the General Conference, 1990 in Indianapolis. And someone told me that's where it's going to be this, this coming yes. next one. Uh, in 2020, be in Indianapolis. Oh, they were there before. Yeah. B.B. Beach introduces the World Council President. She says, I bring you the warmest of greetings from the World Council of Churches. So as fellow Christians, like those Pentecost people in the earliest of days, we look at one another and we say that we hold all things in common. Fifth business meeting, general conference. 
Then in the sixth one, A. Lee, who's an ecumenical leader, he says a number of us are in attendance because of the invitation of B.B. Beach, also known as Zimri, Numbers chapter 25. Remember, Zimri brings Cosby into the midst of the camp, and Phineas throws the javelin. But here, no Phineas is, no Phineas is here. So B.B. Beach, we're here because of B.B. Beach. He is also secretary of a group to which both of us belong, namely the Secretaries of Christian World Communions. In fact, B.B. Beach was secretary, general secretary of this group for 35 years. And he says, I pray God's richest blessings in this, on this great conference, for truly it is good and pleasant to dwell together in unity. That's the sixth businessman. The ninth, B.B. Beach introduces T.J. Murphy as an observer and official guest, representing the pontifical, oh, he's probably representing himself, just as a casual observer, but no, he's representing the pontifical council for promoting Christian unity. He is here to give greetings on behalf of the Roman Catholic, Roman, on the behalf of the Roman Catholic Church. And everyone, and, the, and that's in the review magazine, they say everyone applauded. T.J. Murphy says, I convey to you the greetings, the prayerful best wishes from the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity and from the Archbishop of Indianapolis, promising and assuring you that prayers are being offered within our community for the blessed success of this general conference. The beast praying for the blessed success of this general conference. For it is the desire of the Savior himself that his disciples might all be one, so that the world may believe. Did you know this happened? 1990? Yes. Unbelievable. In 1991, May 1991, Roy Adams, editor, declares in the review, Adventist Review, page 10, the World Council of Churches, Accentuation of the Holy Spirit, and the Eucharist fits into the ambit of the three angels' messages. Eucharist. That people died at the stake. People were burned at the stake for not believing in the Eucharist. And he says it fits into the ambit of the three angels' messages. And so in 1991, Neil Wilson says there's another universal and truly Catholic organization, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Remember 1991, that was the year the King of the North reached Egypt, atheism. Remember 1991 was when the Soviet Union fell. And by that year, Papal Rome would have gone through the glorious land. Yes, by 1991, it had entered the glorious land. And so we see that in 1995, the Vatican flag was marched in. The Vatican flag marched into the glorious land for the first time in 1995. For the first time in the general conference, the Vatican flag marched in. That means, um, well, I don't know exactly what that means. It should mean that there's an Adventist member in Vatican City, but I don't see how that can be. Um, but I think what it really means is that the King of the North has entered the glorious land. Yes, that's what it means. And so by 1991, look, we have a Catholic structure a Catholic medical system, a Catholic educational system, a Catholic Jesus, a Catholic God, a Catholic hymnal, a Catholic approved Bible, NIV, and the Sabbath light of the God. Has the King of the North entered the glorious land? Yeah, the only thing that remains is the Sabbath. And many shall be overthrown. Many because no one realizes what's happening. Um, Oh, she says this. If the power of Satan can come into the very temple of God and manipulate things as he pleases, the time of preparation will be prolonged. 
The fearful result, but she says in great controversy, the fearful result of enforcing the observances of the church by civil authority, the inroads of spiritualism, the stealthy but rapid progress of papal power, all will be unmasked. And so, today, we have a hierarchical church structure. And at the top, ecumenicalism is pulling for the allegiance of the mind. At the bottom, you see the three angels' messages pulling for the allegiance of the church members. These are two diametrically opposite forces pulling for the allegiance. And in a, in a, in a structure can't handle all that force pulling on each side because these are powerful spiritual forces and what's happening is just what happened in Christ's day humble layman and a few priests are following yes the three angels messages they will finish the work while the ecumenicalism people will stay with the ship and follow ecumenicalism and the, and the leaders and they will oh but certainly we have a few people up at the top. Don't we still have a few people at the top? Yes, Nicodemus. He's up there, probably. But like Nicodemus, he will join God's people. Uh, and hopefully not like Nicodemus, when he wished he could have done it much sooner than he did. When Jesus was alive, he waited until he was dead. He was dead. And, but today they're treating truth like they treated Jesus in his day. And... The three angels' messages will be crucified by the nominal Adventists and Christianity, just like Jesus was. And if they crucify the three angels' messages, they're crucifying those who stand on the three angels' messages. So God bless us with courage. The general conference structure, Roman Catholic control, is going one way, but God's people are standing firmly on the platform of truth, the glorious land, and they're escaping out of his hand, out of the kingdom of the North's hand. They're going to stick with the truth, with the truth of Jesus. While the general conference and its followers separate from the structure of truth. Okay. Three angels' messages are the, are, is the glorious land today. Now, White says in a special sense, Seventh day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. To them has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. They have been given a work of the most solemn import, the proclamation of the first, second, and third angels' messages. They are, there is no other work of so great importance. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. Volume 9, page 19. So that means that true Seventh-day Adventists are giving the three angels' messages. If you want to be a true Seventh-day Adventist, understand the three angels' messages and share it with others. The first angels' message with the everlasting gospel, cleanses us from our own sins. The second angel's message, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of sins, cleanses us from corporate sin. Then we're standing on the third angel's messages, clothed with Christ's righteousness by faith, waiting for Christ's second coming. That's a simple overview of the three angel's messages. Righteousness by faith in verity. We need to be cleansed from our own sins and corporate sin. The Adventist Church is in corporate sin today, it's worshiping a false god. It's sending its members into the armed forces to kill people. And in its hospitals, it's performing abortions on demand. That's three corporate sins that need to be repented of. But tidings out of the east and out of the north, Daniel 11, 44, shall trouble him. This is a repeat of the three angels' messages of 1840 and 44. The three angels' messages will be repeated. Tidings out of the east is by God's people. And out of the north, I think, it will be by people that are converted who have never been in the Advent movement. But they'll, they'll pick up the simple gospel and the simple three angels' messages and start proclaiming it where they are and doing the work that Advent should have done. They'll pick up the slack and that will trouble the papacy, the kingdom of art, and therefore he shall go forth with great fury to, to destroy and utterly to make away many, but then Jesus comes to deliver his people. A vision of the night. This is Ellen White's vision in my very girl, girlhood. The Lord saw fit to open before me the glories of heaven. And I was in vision, taken to heaven, and the angel said to me, look. I looked to the world, and it was in dense darkness. The agony that came over me was indescribable as I saw this darkness. And again the word came, look ye. And again, I looked intensely over the world, and I began to see jets of light like stars dotted all through this darkness. 
And then I saw another and another added light. And so all through this moral darkness, the starlight lights were increasing. The angel said, these are they that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and are obeying the words of Christ. See, there's a glorious light. Everything else in the world is darkness. And I forgot to show a shine, sign, sh uh, slide where if we trust in Christ, we're like trees planted by the living water. If we don't trust in Christ, we're like a desert, desert plant in the desert. So as God looks through his spiritual binoculars over the earth, the glorious land are those that are trusting in him, trees planted by the living water. In this, in this term, in the darkness, those who are shining are the glorious land. Everyone else is in darkness. And these are they that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and are obeying the words of Christ. These are the light of the world, and if it were not for these lights, the judgments of God would immediately fall upon the transgressors of God's law. So your light, remember, ye are the light of the world. We have a big responsibility individually. Don't wait to think, oh, I'll wait for the church to develop some program. Just think, Holy Spirit, what do you want me to do? What track can I pass out? You know, what, what am I good at that I can do? Uh, and so, these are the, this is the glorious land shining. I saw then that these light, little jets of light growing brighter, shining forth from the east and the west and from the north and the south and lighting the whole world. <coughs> Occasionally, one of these lights would begin to grow dim and others would go out. And every time this occurred, there was sadness and weeping in heaven. And some of the lights would grow brighter and their brightness was far-reaching, and many more lights were added to them. Then there was rejoicing in heaven. I saw that the rays of light came directly from Jesus to form these precious jets of light in this world. In Great Controversy 6.12, she says, Now the rays of light penetrate everywhere. The truth is seen in its clearness. Remember, it's the truth. And the honest children of God, the glorious land, sever the bands which have held them, Family connections, church relations are powerless to stay them now. Truth is more precious than all besides. Notwithstanding the agencies combined against the truth, a large number take their stand upon the Lord's side. Amen. Next, the final words of the chapter of Great Controversy. The final warning. These are the, that's the last words of that chapter. Then probation closes. Ye are the glorious light of the world. Think of that responsibility. And here in Fort Lauderdale, this church, working individually and corporately, because you have a blessing. You're not just two or three. You can be more than that, and that's the power. And you can be the glorious land right here in this part of Florida. So God bless you all here too. To Preserve the truth and and let it shine forth in the world around us. Here.